Unfortunately, the majority of our public do not welcome your visit because they're angry over Iraq, they're angry over Abu Ghraib. Are you bothered by what Irish people think? Listen, I, I, I hope the Irish people understand the great values of our country. And if they think that a few soldiers represents the entirety of America, they don't really understand America then. Now, there's been great ties between Ireland and America. And uh, there are a lot of Irish Americans here that are very proud of their heritage and their country. Uh, but, uh, you know, they must, they, they, they must not understand if they're angry over Abu Ghraib. If they say, this is what America represents, they, they don't understand our country because we don't represent that. We're a compassionate country. We're a strong country. We'll defend ourselves. But we help people, and, and, and we've helped the Irish, and we'll continue to do so. We've got a good relationship with Ireland. And they're angry over Iraq as well, and particularly well, the continuing death toll there. Well, I, I can understand that. People don't like war, but what they should be angry about is the fact that there was a brutal dictator there that had destroyed lives and put them in mass graves and had torture rooms. Listen, I, I wish they could have seen the seven men that came to see me in the Oval Office. They had their right hands cut off by Saddam Hussein because the currency had devalued when he was the leader. See? And guess what happened? And Americans saw the fact that they had been had their hands cut off and crosses or X's carved in their forehead. And he flew them to America and they came to my office with a new hand, grateful for the generosity of America and and, and, and with Saddam Hussein's brutality in their mind. Now, look, Saddam Hussein had weapon, used weapons of mass destruction against his own people, against the neighborhood. He was a brutal dictator who posed a threat, such a threat that the United Nations voted unanimously to say, Mr. Saddam Hussein... Indeed, Mr. President, but you didn't find the may weapons look, of mass may destruction. Look, may I finish? He said, the United Nations said, disarm or face serious consequences. That's what the United Nations said. And guess what? He didn't disarm. He didn't disclose his arms. And therefore, he faced serious consequences. But we have found the capacity for him to make a weapon. See, he had the capacity to make weapons. He was dangerous. And no one can argue that the world is better off uh, with Saddam Hussein, if Saddam Hussein were in power. But Mr. President, the world is a more dangerous place today. I don't know whether Why do you, you say can that? see that or not. There are terrorist bombings every single day. It's now a daily event. It wasn't like that two years ago. What was it like September the 11th, 2001? It was a, it was a relative calm. But we if thought, your response oh, let me to Iraq... Let me, let me finish, please. Please, you ask the questions and I'll answer them if you don't mind. On September the 11th, 2001, we were attacked in an unprovoked fashion. Everybody thought the world was calm. And then there had been bombings since then. Not because of my response to Iraq. There were bombings in Madrid. There were bombings in uh, Istanbul. There were bombings in Bali. There were killings in Pakistan. Indeed, Mr. President, and I, I think Irish people understand that, but I think there is a feeling that the world has become a more dangerous place because you have taken the focus off Al-Qaeda and diverted into Iraq. Do you not see that the world is a more dangerous place? I saw four of your soldiers lying dead on the television the other day, a picture of four soldiers just lying there without their flags. You know, on. listen, nobody cares more about the death than I do. Is there a point at which... Let me finish, please, please. I, I, let me finish, and then you can follow up if you don't mind. Nobody cares more about the death than I do. I care about it a lot. But I do believe the world is a safer place and becoming a safer place. I know that a free Iraq is going to be uh, uh, necessary part of changing the world. Listen, people, people join terrorist organizations because there's no hope. And there's no chance to raise their families in a, in, a, in a peaceful world where there is not freedom. And so the idea is to promote freedom and at the same time protect our security. And I do believe the world is becoming a better place, absolutely. Mr. President, you are a man who has a great faith in God. I've heard you say many times that uh, you strive to some serve somebody greater than yourself. Right. Do you believe that the hand of God is, is guiding you in this war on terror? I, I think, listen, I, I think that God, that my relationship with God is a very personal relationship. And I turn to the good Lord for strength. And I, I turn to the good Lord for guidance. I turn to the good Lord for forgiveness. But, 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 but the God I know is not one that, uh, uh, that, uh, the God I know is one that, that, that promotes peace and freedom. And uh, 
but I get great sustenance from my personal relationship. That doesn't make me think I'm a better person than you are, by the way. Because one of the great admonitions in the good book is, don't try to take a speck out of your eye if I got a log in my own. You're going to meet Bertie Ahern when you arrive in Shannon Airport tomorrow. Yeah. I guess he went out on the limb for you, presumably because of the great friendship between our two countries. Can you look him in the eye when you get there and say, it will be worth it, it will work out? Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't have made the decisions I did if I didn't think the world would be better. Of course. But I'm not going to put people in harm's way or young if I didn't think the world would be better. Why is it now, that let the me, let, me, let, me, let me finish. And so, yes, I can turn to my friend Bertie Ahern and say, thank you. Thanks for helping. And uh, I appreciate it very much. And there will be other challenges, by the way. Why is it that others don't understand what you're about? I don't know. I don't know. History will judge what I'm about. But I'm the kind of person I don't really try to chase popular uh, polls, popularity polls. That's, my job is to do my job and make the decisions that I think are important for our country and for the world. And uh, uh, I, I, I argue strongly that the world is better off because of the decisions that I have made, along with others. America is not in this alone. Uh, with one of our greatest allies of all, of all, uh, in the world is your neighbor, Great Britain. Tony Blair has been a strong advocate for for uh, not only battling terrorists, but for promoting freedom, for which I am grateful. Let me say one other thing about America that, that your viewers must know, is that not only are we uh, working hard to promote security and peace, we're also working to uh, eradicate famine and disease. There's no more generous country in the face of the earth than the United States of America when it comes to fighting HIV AIDS. As a matter of fact, Do it was my initiative, so? my initiative. Uh, that asked Congress to spend $15 billion over five years to battle this pandemic. And we're following through on it. And, and no other country in the world f feeds more of the hungry than the United States. And so we're a compassionate nation. Mr. President, I know your time is tight. Can I move you on to, um, to Europe? Are you satisfied that, that you are getting enough help in Iraq from European countries? You have come together. You are more friendly now. But they're not really stepping up to the plate with help, are they? Well, I, I think, first of all, most of Europe supported the decision in Iraq. It's, really what you're talking about is France, isn't it? And, uh, uh, and they, they didn't agree with my decision. They did vote for the UN Security Council resolution that said, disclose, disarm, or face serious consequences. We just had a difference of opinion about when you say something, do you mean it? And, but nevertheless, I, there's no doubt in my mind, President Chirac would like to see a free and democratic and whole Iraq emerge. And uh, same in Afghanistan. They've been, they've been very helpful in Afghanistan. They're willing to forgive debt in Iraq. But most European countries are very supportive and, very, and, and, and are participating in the reconstruction of Iraq. And how do you see the handover going? The next few weeks are going to be crucial. Can democracy really flourish with the violence that's going on? A hundred Iraqis dead today, Mr. President. Yeah, no, I, I don't like death either. I mean, you keep emphasizing the death, and I don't blame you. But all that goes to show is the nature of the enemy. These people are willing to kill innocent people. They're willing to slaughter innocent people to stop the advance of freedom. And so the free world has to make a choice. Do we cower in the face of terror, or do we lead in the face of terror? And uh, I, uh, I'm going to lead in the face of terror. We will not let these terrorists dash the hopes and ambitions of the people of Iraq. There's some kind of attitude that says, oh, gosh, the terrorists attack. Let's let the Iraqis suffer more. We're not going to let them suffer more. We're going to work with them. And I'm most proud of this fellow, uh, Prime Minister Alawi. He's strong and he's tough. He says to me, Mr. President, don't leave our country. Help us secure our country so we can be free. Indeed, Mr. President, just to, just to get back to that, um, can, can I just turn to the Middle East? Sure. Um, you are, will be discussing at the EU summit um, the idea of bringing democracy to the broader, broader Middle East. Right. Um, is that something that really should start, though, with the solving of the Israeli-Palestinian crisis? Well, I think, first of all, you've got a, a, a democracy in Turkey. And you've got a democracy emerging in Afghanistan. You've got a democracy in Pakistan. In other words, but it, shouldn't th that be on no, the top please, of the list? Please, please. Please for a minute, okay? It would be better if you let me finish my answers and then, and then you can follow up if you don't mind. Uh, and, and what I'm telling you is that democracy can emerge at the same time that a democracy can emerge in the Palestinian state. I'm the first American president to have called for the establishment of a Palestinian state. The first one to do so. Because I believe it is in the Palestinian people's interest. 
I believe it's in Israel's interest. And yes, we're working, but we can do more than uh, you know, one thing at a time. And we are working on the roadmap with, uh, uh, with the quartet to advance the process down the road. Uh, like Iraq, uh, the Palestinian and the Israeli issue is going to require good security measures. And a bit and, more even-handedness from America? Uh, and we're working on security measures. In America, I'm the first president to ever have called for a Palestinian state. That's, to me, sounds like a, a reasonable, balanced approach. And, uh, uh, but I will not allow terrorists to determine the fate, as best I can, determine the fate of people who want to be free. Mr. President, thank you very much for talking to You're us. You're welcome.